So roughly this time last year, um, so I'm an organizer of PyCon Australia, and uh, somebody uh, on the PyCon Australia organizers list uh, pointed out a really, really interesting uh, article that had been written by uh, somebody who'd uh, come from venture capital and asked in an article, what is the one thing that the tech world cannot do without that is not backable by venture? And by the end of this article, she had uh, proposed that digital infrastructure in the form of open source software was that one thing. And in that article, uh, started uh, lifting the lid on what was the dire uh, state of funding in the world of open source. Um, I was actually told by a senior member of our community that everyone who matters in open source at the moment is being paid for it. Um, this might be the case for big projects like Linux or OpenStack, but upon interviewing numerous project maintainers, Nadia Egbal pointed out that it's just simply not true for smaller scale libraries that the entire open source world depends upon. Uh, Nadia's work culminated in a 142 page report, which is excellent, you should read it, as published by the Ford Foundation and entitled Roads and Bridges, the Unseen Labor Behind Our Digital Infrastructure. And in the abstract, um, it, she said, in the face of unprecedented demand, the costs of not supporting our digital infrastructure are numerous. No individual company or organization is incentivized to address the public good problem alone. Um, so we invited Nadia to come along and give a keynote, and, which she accepted. And we're incredibly happy to be able to welcome here to give our keynote today. Uh, please welcome Nadia Egbal. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me early on a Thursday morning. Um, so I'm Nadia. Um, as Chris mentioned, I've spent the last year and a half researching open source communities to understand how we can better support the infrastructure that our entire society depends on. Uh, and so I decided to name this talk Consider the Maintainer after an essay written by David Foster Wallace, which was first published in Gory Magazine um, called Consider the Lobster. Consider the Lobster is David Foster account of the 2003 Maine Lobster Festival, which is an annual event that draws over 80,000 people to eat over 25,000 pounds of fresh-caught Maine lobster. So way back in the day, um, in the 1800s, um, eating lobster was considered a low-class food. Apparently, they used to force inmates to eat it um, in early American colonies. But over the next two centuries, um, thanks to a great marketing campaign, Lobster went from being this punishment food to everyone wanting to eat it. Um, but as David Foster Wallace points out, um, there's this one small detail involved, which is that preparing this meal requires boiling the lobster alive in a pot of water. <laughs> so lobster's whole luxury appeal um, is that it's extremely fresh. But in order to get that freshness, we have to subject a living creature to extreme stress, captivity, and a very painful death. And so the rest of his essay dives into this question, um, which is, is it all right um, to boil a sentient creature alive just for our gustatory pleasure? And there's a follow-up question, um, because I know what you're thinking. Is the previously question <laughs> irksomely PC or sentimental? Um, I promise I did not lure you all into an animal welfare talk, um, but maybe you can guess where I'm going here, um, which is that when it comes to open source and the future of open source, the question I wrestle with is, is it all right if a project struggles or dies because the maintainer can't keep up with it anymore? Another way of thinking about this is, is it all right to compromise or even deliberately ignore the happiness of maintainers so that we can enjoy free and open source software? And so David Foster Wallace doesn't make judgments. Um, he still eats lobster. But rather than being preachy about it, in his words, um, he emphasizes that what he really is is just confused. And so instead, he asks questions. Um, he says it's not really about finding the answer, but rather recognizing that this whole animal cruelty eating thing, um, it's not just complex, it's also personally uncomfortable. Those of us who eat and enjoy meat also don't want to see ourselves as cruel or unfeeling. So his way of dealing with it is to basically avoid thinking about the whole unpleasant thing. 
Uh, so similarly, I'm aware that conversations about open source's culture um, have the tendency to get uncomfortable. People's identities, um, their way of seeing the world get challenged, and that's often not a pleasant experience. And so as you listen to this talk, um, I ask you to resist the temptation towards moral outrage, um, whether it's for or against these ideas, um, but to instead take this as a set of questions and explore them on your own um, and with others. I hope it prompts you to think about um, who's behind the production of open source, what goes into providing these services to the public, and what we're willing to tolerate in the name of having both free as in freedom and free as in zero cost software. So that's what we're gonna dive into. Um, let's start by looking at the symptoms. Um, I will start with the obvious. A lot has changed for open source in the last 20 years. Um, and for one, more people are consuming open source software than ever before. And so I'll give you some numbers to wrap your head around. In 1998, Netscape, um, which I'll add is a large company with a large audience, um, open sourced its browser, and their idea of a large success was getting nearly 200,000 downloads in the first two weeks. And today, some of the most popular small packages, um, we're talking like one small package written by a few developers, will receive upwards of 18 million downloads in that same time period. That's 100x difference. Um, and I recognize that a Netscape browser and a small package are not exactly apples to apples, um, but numbers are really hard to find. More on that later. Um, so where are all these downloads coming from? Well, in 2001, um, around the time that Netscape open sourced its browser, there were roughly 208,000 registered users on SourceForge. Today, there are 14 million registered users on GitHub. That's a 70x difference. Um, and so adding to these problems is that the number of maintainers per open source project has stayed the same, or if anything, gone down. If that's not intuitive to you, there was a recent study of the top projects on GitHub um, across six different languages, and they found that two-thirds of them are being maintained by just one or two people. So that means we're talking uh, 70x or 100x growth in users, um, but zero or negative growth in the number of maintainers per project. Um, this graph is not actually real, but just visualize in your mind. Um, and so why haven't the number of maintainers grown in proportion to the users or contributors? Um, I have a couple theories. So firstly, um, from a high level, the same thing that's happened to blogging or journalism, games, entertainment, um, basically any other creative sector you can think of also happened to software. It became fragmented. A lot of people want to make a lot of little things. Um, and so now we have many more smallish projects with single maintainers versus a few big projects with multiple maintainers. Two, um, to be blunt, maintaining a project can kind of suck sometimes. Um, everyone gets excited by a shiny new greenfield project. Authoring something new is fun. Maintainers, by contrast, spend a lot of their time triaging issues, reviewing and merging others' work, um, responding to support requests, and while those activities can be rewarding for various reasons on their own, um, it can take a certain stomach to handle that constant barrage for years and years. So it's basically this old familiar um, content creation rule applied to software, where 1% of people are creating the content that 99% of people consume. Um, except it's more like if bloggers had to respond to each and every comment on the internet and um, merge it back into their original post. It's a lot of work. And in fact, um, you had authors like Steven Weber, who's a political scientist, um, cautioning even back in 2004, um, which I'll note was pre-GitHub, pre-social media, um, pre-everything and how we communicate today, um, saying that this was a real potential danger to open source. And here he's talking about evolution as an analogy, and he's saying that evolution is this really messy process. Um, and so he says, rapid evolution poses the risk of overwhelming a system, thus introducing errors more quickly than the system can fix them. And so that's basically exactly what happened when open source consumption began to scale in tandem with the so-called Web 2.0 era. Um, and so people began using software, reporting errors, asking for help at a pace that didn't match a growth in production. Consumption scales um, if there's no additional cost to the producer, which is true for written content on the internet um, or YouTube videos, but it's not true for open source um, because more users and contributors actually does create more work for the maintainer. Uh, 
And so now you have this growing imbalance between people who use open source software and the people who maintain it. Um, these diagrams come from Michael Rogers from Node.js. Um, you can ignore the TC part. That's another thing. Um, but the important part is that on the left is how projects are ideally balanced. And on the right is the situation that we find ourselves in today. And so having to deal with new people is not problematic in itself. Um, and in fact, for pro uh, small projects that are less popular or popular projects that are narrower in scope, um, the increase in users and contributors isn't necessarily hard to handle. But for many other popular projects, um, the scale of users today and the speed at which we're expected to communicate creates this whole new set of problems. There are also a few other challenges unique to today's open source users, um, which I think this particular comment reveals. And so one, um, many users today are new to software development, probably more than at any point in software's history, um, besides maybe the beginning. Um, and so a lot of people don't actually understand the norms, and it falls on maintainers to teach them. Um, the other thing I think this reveals is that, frankly, GitHub as a tool um, where most open source is now being built hasn't really done the best job of helping maintainers manage the influx of requests. I mean, that's something that I hope we get better at in the next couple of years. Making things worse um, is that maintainers often face these issues alone and in isolation, um, sometimes for the first time, rather than together on a big collaborative project. Maintainers themselves are lacking support and mentorship. And so this has led to some interesting new behaviors and dynamics. Um, for one, people start seeing themselves as users rather than as potential collaborators. Um, I'm not showing people's names here because I don't believe in the whole tarring and feathering thing, um, but if you look through different types of examples, you'll see these themes of people talking about waste of their time, respect for their users. Um, this is another one. And I think what's interesting about both of these examples in particular is that they were being made by fairly prominent people in non-open source parts of software world. Um, these aren't brand new developers. They're people that other developers look up to for guidance. Which suggests um, there's this deep disconnect between how today's developers understand open source software and what the norms are or should be. So this type of behavior um, leads to this sort of like general, general stress and anxiety that a lot of maintainers are feeling towards their projects. One example is James Kyle, who's a maintainer on Babel, a JavaScript compiler. Um, and when they released Babel 6, an API change prompted a strong backlash among users. To which he said that Babel went from being one of the most fun experiences of his life to making him feel terrible every day. And it, actually, I wasn't gonna add this quote, um, but this landed in my notifications on Monday. Um, this comes from a maintainer of Mocha, which is the most depended on project in Node with over 100,000 module dependencies. <clears throat> and I thought this quote was interesting to include um, because he's explicitly saying that he's not looking for help, or he is looking for help with maintenance work, um, stuff like merging PRs. He's not looking for additional code contributions. Um, that need for maintenance as a particular discipline is something that's hardly talked about when we talk about bringing new people into open source today. We talk about helping people open their first pull request, but we're not talking about helping them triage issues. Um, and so that's what I want to get into here which is basically, why aren't we talking more about this? It seems like the experience of being a software maintainer is often minimized or even deliberately ignored. Maintainers are told that negative behavior is normal, it's been around since the beginning of open source, and yet the scale at which they're dealing with it today warrants a different kind of conversation. These mixed messages make it hard for maintainers to know when to push back. Why is it still so difficult and even controversial to talk about the maintainer experience? Um, to answer that, we're gonna take a little trip back in history. My guess is that it some of it has to do with the current language that's currently being used to describe free and open source. So starting with free software, um, free software was not designed with popularity in mind. So Richard Stallman explained it as, um, our goal should be to spread freedom and then defend it that's more important than making our software popular, which would just be catering to our egos. So the founding values of free software were around protecting the right to distribute, or in other words, protecting the needs of the user. That meant that free software advocates were explicitly unconcerned with how the software was being produced. 
Stallman said that free software can be written by one person or it can be written by a group of people, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that it remains free. And the rights of software producers only matter in as much as legal freedoms and protections are concerned. And so from what I can tell, um, this hands-off approach came from a good place. It came from wanting to absolve producers from any legal issues associated with the software. And that's why some, some licenses use the term as is to emphasize that they're not liable for anything that happens. And researching this talk, um, the lack of interest in this production side was explained to me uh, by someone as some people create software sometimes. Basically, if a project gets too popular and the maintainers can't keep up, maybe the project will die and everyone will just move on to something else. <clears throat> Another example of this language is in the Debian social contract, um, which was first written and ratified in 1997. All of these terms are oriented towards the concerns and needs of the user and what pro producers promise to provide them. Um, I'll particularly point out the fourth bullet point, which says, we will be guided by the needs of our users and the free software community. We will place their interests first in our priorities. So if you're sitting in the room thinking, well, that's just those free software people, um, let's take a look at open source. Um, open source became a distinct movement from free software in the late 1990s. But again, it distinguished itself based on benefits to the user. The idea behind the movement was primarily based on how to get people to use the software. Um, and so this quote comes from Eric Raymond's takeaways from the open source summit, where the term open source was first coined and the open source initiative was created. Um, and he says, the implication of the open source label is that we intend to convince the corporate world to adopt our way for all these various reasons. Um, and we still see that in OSI's mission today, um, where their mission is about educating and advocating for the benefits of open source, um, building bridges among different constituencies. Um, so again, there's this focus on spreading the word, um, but there's nothing in here about helping producers. And so today, um, open source is frequently characterized as the pragmatic movement and free software as the moral movement, um, if you'll excuse my gross oversimplifications. But what's interesting for our discussion today is that both are still oriented around the user. For free software, it's the moral obligation to make sure that the four freedoms of users are protected. And for open source, it's touting the pragmatic benefits around the quality of software produced in this manner. Nowhere in here do we see the maintainer represented. The maintainer's needs only exist in relation to what they provide the user, which are legal freedoms in the case of free software or practical benefits in the case of open source. <clears throat> Something's missing from the conversation today. Um, it's not really about free versus open source anymore, but it's more about are you prioritizing the needs of the user or of the producer? Um, and really what's implied by the producer, I'll add, is um, not just maintainers, but also contributors and how that whole production process is organized. Um, but I'm focusing on maintainers because they're the ones who are in charge of organizing that process. So um, when Richard Selman f developed the idea of free software, um, he outlined four freedoms that go with them. Again, all very user-oriented. This list probably looks familiar to you. Um, and so I started thinking, if we were going to outline the freedoms of producers today, what might that look like? Uh, so these are some of my ideas. I would love to hear yours. Um, I came up with the freedom to decide who participates in your community, the freedom to say no to contributions or requests, the freedom to define the priorities and policies of the project, the freedom to step down or move on from a project temporarily or permanently. And so whether you use the freedoms here or you make up your own, um, I think the beauty of having them so clearly outlined is that it puts the burden back on these so-called users to figure out how to get what they need. So if a user doesn't like a particular project, um, they can use it as is. They can submit suggestions or fixes. They can work on their own version. They can find a different project entirely. Um, but in the end, they can't expect anything more from the maintainer than what that person is willing to give. These were the original intentions of open source production. Um, that other people don't just use, but also learn how to help themselves. Reasserting that language helps put agency back into the hands of the maintainer. It also creates a bunch of opportunities to tackle other issues that maintainers face. <clears throat> so I'll run through a couple examples here. Um, community best practices. 
Everyone's being told to find contributors to their project, but it's not always obvious how to do so. How many contributors are enough? How do I turn first-time contributors into regulars? How fast should I respond to issues? There are a ton of best practices around community building that haven't been made explicit yet. Some of those practices have also changed um, thanks to new ways of communicating with each other and figuring out how to corral large volumes of users and turn them into contributors. Having clear baselines for community health and being able to measure against them means that maintainers don't have to keep figuring this out over and over again in silos. Project analytics. Um, there are metrics around project usage. I know I will make some enemies here, um, but I feel very strongly about this, that maintainers should have the right to measure user behavior as they wish. Data empowers maintainers to prioritize their time, to design for the right use case, and to raise money, among other things. <clears throat> not only should we not criticize maintainers when they add metrics to a project, but we should actively encourage them to do so. Metrics give maintainers yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm not making enemies here. That's cool. Um, <laughs> metrics give maintainers more tools to be successful. Um, speaking of tools, um, there are a bunch of tools that exist to automate work for maintainers, um, including testing, triaging, monitoring. Um, not enough of them exist, especially when it comes to automating the whole human coordination side of things. We need more people making, using, and sharing tools that help maintainers. Conveying support status. Um, right now, there's an odd assumption that maintainers are obligated to respond to every single issue or pull request that's open on their project <clears throat> into perpetuity. Um, I think we should experiment with that assumption. So a few ideas I've heard of in this space are the idea of creating a common support status. So saying this project is not accepting contributions, either because the project is done or because it's not being actively maintained. Um, or trying something more like peer source, which is a term coined by Jonathan Zadarsky, um, which limits contributions to a smaller number of contributors that he's personally vetted. And I know that seems um, intuitively wrong, but consider that firstly, um, not every contribution gets accepted into an open source project anyway, for reasons that are entirely at a maintainer's discretion. Um, so this is simply making that behavior explicit. Um, and secondly, limiting contributions on your project doesn't mean that someone can't copy and modify the code for their own purposes. You're just talking about who can contribute back to your version. Finding funding. Um, not everybody wants to get paid to work on open source. Some people prefer not having the obligation that comes with financial support. Um, others are indirectly paid to work on it by their employer. But any project that does want financial support should have an avenue to get that. Right now, the best ways to raise and use money aren't clear, um, particularly because the sources of funding are still somewhat ad hoc. Do I ask for donations? Um, do I start a foundation? Do I ask companies for sponsorships? It's just really not clear. Um, but I do think that open source is too important not to have institutional backing. And so some foundations have begun offering grants for open source projects, but we still have a long way to go to figure this out. And then finally, there's just like all the meta stuff. Like, what does it mean to be a maintainer? Um, and what do I need to know to be a good one? <clears throat> stuff like learning how to say no and write a roadmap um, or remembering to take vacation are all important parts of being a maintainer. Talking about that shared experience will become increasingly important as we see more small but popular projects with just one or two maintainers. And so I think any one of these areas um, could become an area of expertise, just like people have developed an expertise around open source licensing. Um, there's a lot of potential here that hasn't yet been captured. So I'm gonna end by um, contradicting myself from before and saying it's not that nobody has been talking about the production of open source. This is our friend Steven Weber again, um, talking about one of Eric Raymond's most best known essays, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And he's referring to the statement that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So as I mentioned, um, this book was first published in 2004. People have been talking about the production side for a very long time. It was kind of one of the key parts of open source, um, being able to tout the benefits to the user. We just haven't updated our idea of, of how open source is actually being produced today. 
in the process of all this research, um, I've dug into a lot of writing from the late 1990s and the early 2000s, and I've noticed that the success of open source, um, which incidentally is the title of this particular book, um, the success of open source really meant the success of Linux. And a few other big projects, um, which still persist today. Um, back then, there were very few examples to go by. And so when there were just a couple of these um, big projects in the scene, and some promising companies like Red Hat, or foundations like the Apache Software Foundation, coming out of that, the future looked quite rosy for open source. It was assumed that open source was so important that we would continue to find a way to make it sustainable. And then social media happened, and then GitHub happened, and then the internet exploded with content creation. And then there was this uptick in open source adoption um, at a level that, frankly, nobody was prepared for. And then everyone just kind of stopped talking about how projects were taking care of themselves um, and how those maintainers were handling the workload. Like, I actually stopped finding anything interesting being written about open source um, production since, let's say, 2005. There's just nothing there. Um, and since then, we've upheld this perfect ideal of what we think open source production looks like based on how things worked 10 or 20 years ago versus the less ideal reality of today. People like to point to Linux as an example of successful open source, of people getting paid to work on open source. And we quietly ignored the hundreds or thousands of projects that have appeared since then, which never saw the scale of support that Linux did. When the only mainstream story about open source, um, meaning a story that people outside of open source know, um, when the only mainstream story is the success of Linux, the struggles and challenges of thousands of other projects are getting swept under the rug. History did not end with the success of Linux. It started a new chapter. If we want to talk about the needs of producers, um, whether that's funding or contributors or just people problems, we have to confront the awkward fact that open source today is not what open source was 20 years ago. And we need to update the history books so that everybody else in the world outside of open source knows that too, and we can pitch in with figuring out the solutions. So I've landed on the same conclusion as David Foster Wallace. This stuff is really confusing. Um, we're in a world that's shifting in some radical and decentralized ways. And yet we're also struggling to adapt our economic systems to reflect these new behaviors. I don't think that anybody has figured that out in the world for any sector. I think that's okay, um, but just because we don't understand it yet doesn't mean we should ignore it. And worse, we shouldn't try to regress back to a different way of life. We just kind of need to acknowledge where we're at and try to find a way to move forward. And I remind you again that David Foster Wallace still ate lobster. Um, he still ate the lobster at the festival, but that didn't stop him from wondering about the struggling, the thrashing, and the lid clattering that came with it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Uh, I have a microphone here, and I'm willing to take it up the stairs to people who put their hands up if they have questions uh, to ask of Nadia. Coming back on. <laughs> Hi. Not getting away that easily. Nope, apparently not. Any questions? Thanks, Russ. Thank you so much for that, Nadia. It was fantastic. Um, you're uh, working with GitHub now. And a lot of this explosion, if not directly because of GitHub, has certainly been enabled by GitHub which puts GitHub in a very interesting position of power, both from the point of view of they can turn the ship, but, all for, uh, but they can also set community expectations and things like that. So what do you see as the responsibility and potential for an organization like GitHub, who has this position of power, to, to do some of the things you're talking about here, and the responsibility of them to, uh, to use that power wisely, I suppose? Yeah, I think it's a really important and really open question. Um, it's actually why I joined GitHub. Um, to clarify, like I, I joined GitHub maybe six months ago, less than that, um, and it was after I had done all this research and basically concluded that GitHub was the place where if I wanted to make these kinds of changes, um, that was sort of the center of where that's all gonna happen. Um, I think that the way that GitHub should be supporting open source better comes from a lot of things around the product itself. Um, I think one of the, the hardest things about open source right now 
<clears throat> is not just the licensing part, but also how people are actually collaborating with each other. Um, and did I mess up my mic? I might have messed up. Okay. Um, and so, like, issues, for example, are like a really simple thing um, on GitHub that probably could have more robust features for, um, for maintainers. Am I sure my mic is okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, I'm hearing something weird. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, part of it is just about establishing a clear relationship between GitHub and the maintainers, or essentially the power users on GitHub's platform. Um, so building that sort of community, giving them a direct line of feedback. Um, what happened last year with Gear GitHub um, was a big open letter. I'm not crazy, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, a uh, big open letter from maintainers to uh, GitHub, basically just saying we want to be heard. Um, that's something that I really hope we can improve in terms of relationship. And then, yeah, just giving maintainers the tools they need to actually be successful to coordinate massive amounts of human effort. Um, I think that's going to be a really big part of what GitHub can do, um, more so than, say, like the funding side of it. They're probably more interested in like the structural part of it. Any other questions? Well, I can see one back here giving me my morning exercise. In the middle. Of course it's in the middle. Hi. Um, you said, as you've pointed out earlier, GitHub and before at SourceForge uh, contain a mix of, of large popular projects, which are for the most part healthy, and hearing. also a number of small but crucial projects that have a lot of users but not very many contributors or maintainers. I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh, is this, is this actually, oh, there we go. Sorry, I'm not speaking into it properly. Cool. <laughs> um, sorry, as you said, on GitHub and before it on SourceForge, there are examples of, of big popular projects which are often quite healthy, and there are examples of struggling but popular projects with a small number of maintainers but many users. The reason I've always been a little bit dubious about statistics in the form of, you know, X percent of projects on GitHub or SourceForge or whatever, is that there's also, there are obviously a lot, in fact, possibly dominated by small and never really popular projects that never really got off the ground or are just somebody's uh, personal thing. Do you have any ideas about how you would distinguish those categories and, and generate more meaningful metrics about, about when does a project reach critical mass, that it's, that it's an important one, not one that it's okay for it to die, it's an experiment, and, and that's fine. Yes, totally. Um, right now, one of the hardest things about measuring popular projects is that a lot of people are using stars on GitHub, which, as we all know, is kind of useless. Um, and so I think like the language I've been hearing in the past like six months to a year, um, or just hearing more and more of, is around the concept of dependencies and measuring how. Uh, how many other projects are depending on this project is a better measure of an important project than something that is just popular. Because um, you could even have projects that people talk about a lot and people are excited about and um, even like download for themselves but then don't really use in anything that's sort of like infrastructure related. Um, so Libraries IO is, a, a, I guess, nonprofit, um, an organization that's trying to measure dependencies across like basically every package manager. Um, I think they're doing a really good job of it. Um, I'm hoping that we have better metrics for stuff like this by the end of this year, um, just because it's really hard to talk about things in the abstract and in anecdotes um, when you can hear from the ground um, that a lot of maintainers are struggling, but then you don't have the numbers to be able to like, back things up. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm so, like, so, so bullish on um, the importance of project metrics. But yeah, I think I would, I would start thinking more about like, dependencies versus um, stars or even downloads. Hi, Nadja. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm curious. It seems to me from a historical perspective that maintainers have lost um, authority and prestige. Would you attribute any of that to the rise of agile programming? Hmm. Say more, Kat, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to expose my implicit bias here. Yeah. Um, 
it seems like there's more of a culture of I have an idea, next, next, next. And I see sometimes maintainers being treated as obstacles to the next mm. cool thing as opposed to people that have the larger global viewpoint of how to keep the project technically functional. Um, but that's just me. I was wondering what you thought. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think actually um, I share that bias very strongly. Um, I think, and part of this comes from my own lived experience as a total amateur coming into programming and realizing like, oh, people are just, when they teach you today, like they just give you a whole bunch of tools and they're like, type in these three things and then magic will appear. Um, and that was actually my first exposure to open source was going, okay, I like typed in these things and then something happened, but I know that these three words did not create that whole application, like what happened under the hood. Um, and I think that's, I, I didn't go super deeply into detail here, um, partly because I don't think we have a lot of numbers around this, but <clears throat> um, just the idea that like anecdotally we can see that more and more people are learning to code today. Um, coding does not mean the same thing as it used to 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and so you have a lot of people identifying as developers or people who can make things um, that are just touching less parts of the software than they used to. And I think like on balance that's a really good thing for the world because it means that the world is just becoming more malleable. and you have these tools that it's like, it's like having a hammer on the ground and you pick it up and like, you can just like do what you want with it. Um, so I think that's actually really cool that coding is becoming so frictionless, but then people forget that under the hood, it's not just a hammer, it's like a human being who is like maintaining all this stuff so that you can do your other thing. Um, and that's like what really strikes me about uh, seeing people saying that like open source has no respect for users and it's just like, do you, do you know like what's going on under the hood? Um, I think a lot of people don't. So yeah, I think there's like probably some sort of clash of culture that will rebalance, hopefully. Yeah. So yeah. your background is in funding. Um, do you have any thoughts on the tensions when you've got a, a volunteer project and you know, people doing it for fun, kind of grows up and tries to cross that line and gets funding and, and, and how that would impact the project dynamics itself if, if one person's paid perhaps and the others are not? Um, do you have any thoughts around that development? Sort of, you mean like the governance questions of, yeah. I mean, I think it's really hard. I think um, when I first jumped into all this, it was really just specifically from the funding perspective. And it's sort of like, you know, you, you pull on a string and more and more starts coming out and you realize like, this is not as easy as, oh, I'll just raise money and then now I know how to, like, now my project is well funded. Um, and I think a lot of it is this governance question of like, if one person's being paid and um, everyone else isn't, does that person have a different kind of obligation or responsibility? Um, I think there are some good blueprints from um, other, other projects that have tried to work this out. Um, I actually think Django's model is probably one of my favorites, um, where they have one paid fellow who is doing more of like the reviewing coordination type work and then other people are contributing um, for free but doing, other, like, doing the types of work that they like to do. Um, so I think part of it is just about being able to identify different types of roles that need being paid for. Um, but yeah, I don't think anyone has really figured it out yet. I think it's like on a per project basis, it's sort of like how do we lay out the governance um, really transparently so people understand who is doing what and who's involved. So it seems to me a lot of your examples are centered around uh, things that are just as true with proprietary software as they are with free software. The kinds of criticism you're quoting, I cer certainly see com people say uh, some proprietary software company has no respect for its users, those sorts of things. That's been common since before free software existed. So I'm wondering if you actually believe proprietary software has done this any better. My view is, is that uh, free software is a necessary but not sufficient condition to solve many of the problems you're saying, and we certainly need a lot of improvement. But I'm wondering if your, your view is proprietary software models such as uh, your company's GitHub's proprietary software has solved these issues by making it proprietary. Hmm. Um, I don't think, I think the difference between proprietary and free software is that in proprietary software you have people who also have to deal with entitled users and whatever you want to call them, um, but they're getting paid to do it all the time. <laughs> And so like everyone has to deal with stuff in their job that they don't like because that's kind of like part of your salary. Um, whereas when someone's doing it completely as a volunteer or whether they're being paid directly or not um, directly, it's the, the stakes are different. And I think 
that's the part that needs to be exposed, um, is just sort of like rehumanizing the work that goes into producing open source, um, to say like, no, you're not a user. Um, I think there's probably room in here to, to dive in even more into like, what is a user and what is a contributor? And are all users actually just potential contributors? Because um, yeah, I, don't, I think ideally, like, there kind of shouldn't really be users in free or open source software. It's like everyone is only a potential contributor. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I think proprietary software has only solved it in that they've um, gotten people to paid salaries so that they don't complain about um, users, but. Happy to take a couple more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. So go here and then up there. So thank you for the talk. I find it fascinating that you bring in the perception of open source by those who are outside of the open source community. And I was wondering if you had thoughts on what we as open source projects that aren't Linux can do to improve the perception of open source in a way that helps maintainers. So you're on Rust, right? Yeah, um, I think Rust has actually done a really great job of humanizing all the work um, behind like the production of open source. Awesome, I, I'm a big fan. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think like the disconnect I see for me is like I, like I only just came into open source from like the research perspective and not as a contributor, um, and coming from like startups or coming from venture and seeing lots of like that developer culture just is like like they. If, if you talk to them about open source, they're like, oh, I love open source, but that means they love using it, but they have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so I think there's just like, like finding ways to like bridge those conversations. Like they're just like completely different worlds and communities. Like I would love to ideally see people from open source coming in to talk to like tech companies or going to like non-open source developer meetups or conferences and saying like, here's what's going on behind the scenes. This is like when you type this, all of these things happen. Um, so yeah, I think it's just like building those relationships and connections between the entire open source world or ecosystem and then like developers who use open source but don't actually understand what's going on. Um, yeah, just making it more human. More question over here and that's all we've got time for. Hi, uh, thank you for a really good intriguing talk. Uh, I have seen on Reddit the last few days, there's been a, a thread collecting uh, Patreon links for various open source projects. And I wonder what your thoughts are on uh, that kind of funding model, which where you, you move the question of who should get the money for the development down to the users and let them decide which of the maintainers they like the best with that kind of Patreon setup. Um, I think crowdfunding and then particularly recurring crowdfunding um, works when you have a very specific deliverable. Um, and so I've seen it, like probably one of the, there are a couple of major projects that have been funded through Patreon. Um, Redux is one of them. Um, Vue.js is another one. Um, but they were sort of like these like, they were like with Redux for example, um, Dan Abramov said like, my project is done. Like I funded it through Patreon for like six months or whatever it was and then he joined Facebook and then that was the end of it. Um, crowdfunding requires a huge following which I think is hard for people that don't always wanna market themselves all the time. Um, I think it's like Patreon as a platform or recurring crowdfunding as a platform. I just haven't seen really like there aren't a lot of examples of people raising tons and tons of money. Um, I think it works better for one time versus recurring because um, not everyone wants to like give ten dollars a month to like twenty different projects. You would be out of money very quickly. Um, so yeah, I think it's like it's like on the I guess supply side, it's really hard to like it's kind of hard to do um, to to crowdfund for an open source project, and then on like the paying outside, I think it's often really unclear. Um, when I've raised all these funds, what exactly do I use it for? Is it for my salary? Is it for um, setting up an entity or, or whatever? Um, is it for hiring outside skills? Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's, I, I, I like seeing like what other people do with the tools that are given to them. Um, I think it's possible for, like if someone can find success that way, then that's great. I just don't think it's gonna work for every single project. So that's all the time we have for uh, questions. Um, we have here to, uh, to thank you for Yay. giving up your, your time and, uh, and sharing your, uh, your expertise with us. A uh, bottle of uh, Tasmanian 100% uh, yes. rye whiskey. 
um, from the uh, from the Belgrove Distillery and a uh, lovely Tasmanian animal figurine. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Such a good talk.